Hello everybody, John here, and today on To The Garage, I thought I'd share with you the front interior controls and quirks of my amazing Nissan El Grand. Now I'm only going to cover the features that occur in the front of the El Grand today because the video will go on and on. There's so many controls, weird features and functions in this vehicle that we'll leave everything behind the B pillar for another day. Okay, so here's the mighty El Grand sports van because you will struggle to define these vehicles with their high profile eight seats in my case, and three and a half litre petrol engine. First thing is, keyless entry. As long as you have the key in your pocket, press the button locked, press the button unlocked. Into the front, first thing that strikes you is pretty luxurious. And this is the moment to say that my car is close to poverty spec. All the El, El Grands are incredibly well specified. This is known as a VG, which is one from the bottom. And the only things that are non-standard on it are related to conversion for UK market. And I will cover those as we go. But just before I jump in, because it is raining, I'm just gonna lean down here and say that there is storage under the floor in the front for, in my case, tools, and it's on the other side as well, and is very useful. And amongst its quirks and features, older Mercedes owners will probably be familiar with the foot emergency or parking brake. There's a release there for the fuel filler flap. Next to it is the bonnet release on the correct side for the UK, which makes a change because of course, Japan drives on the same side as us. Going along the bottom, we have a quite deep cubby that you can put your wallet in, two blanked off switches, uh, a switch that says off main on, that's because there's an onboard inverter and that supplies mains, I think it's actually 110 currently, to a socket in the rear of the vehicle for another day and there's an isolator for the sliding door controls. Because the sliding doors are all motorised, you can stop them operating if you have children. And we have some blank switches because poverty spec. Coming back across, the little grill is for the interior temperature sensing. Black lever is for the steering wheel height. And back over here, we have another storage compartment. And now I can get in. Well, the first thing that strikes you once you're inside the cockpit of the El Grand is how contemporary the dashboard looks. Bear in mind, my car is 17 years old and it's by no means the start of production. You could get one that is over 20 years old, no problem at all. And that does not look out of place. As mentioned when we got in, we have uh, keyless entry. Along with that comes keyless start. So we have a turn barrel, uh, quite common on Japanese market cars. You can insert a key into here if you're having a problem with your remote. Um, but otherwise, as long as it's in your pocket, push in, twist, and that's the ignition on. Turn a little bit further, and the engine fires into life. We just come back to the door. We've got a lovely piece of cloth trim here. As I we have poverty spec. Uh, it would be leather in every model above this, I believe. 
and we have a pretty standard looking front set of switches and door handles. So we have a locking feature here, allows you to lock the door so that it can't be open from the outside and a pull lever to open. Then we have a lockout button for the rear doors so that they can only be unlocked by the driver and a lockout button for the electric windows so again they can only be operated by the driver. Two window switches for the front, auto on the driver's side only. And then we come back, these, unlikely as it sounds, are electric window switches for the rear. Now, obviously this is a van-like vehicle, the windows don't wind down, they pop out, but that doesn't stop them being equipped with electric motors. Down on the door side, we have a very shallow pocket at the front, a deeper, more useful pocket in the normal position, but not very really wide, and a pocket that is actually quite big, but hard to access unless the door is open. Now that's not a big issue for me because I'm keeping useful things in, but I would only want when the door is open. So I've got a set of binoculars there, um, I've got some bags and bits and pieces for collecting rubbish. So all good. Let's come up to the driver's knee. On the right hand side, we have the right rear door opening. Press that and the rear door, as you'll have heard, glides open. If I press that again, soft closed doors. Next we have AFS, can't tell you what it stands for, but the headlights will steer around corners and this turns it on or turns it off. The next button is quite obviously not standard and that illuminates when you press it and the headlights are on and that is the rear fog light. UK cars have to have a rear fog light a lot of countries don't, Japan being one of those, and that is why there's this additional switch here. Up another level on the dashboard, we have the electric mirror controls. This toggle tells it which mirror you want to adjust, sort of standard joystick, joypad, rocker pad, and also a button to fold the mirrors. We have a 12 volt outlet or cigarette lighter socket here on the left hand side of the steering wheel and here we have the corner sensor on off button and I'll show you the parking system on this in a moment but that turns some of the sensors on and off. Back out to the steering wheel and horn push is on the centre pad either side. Left hand side on mine is volume control for the radio and or using the phone. And we have the button to make it listen or make a call. And we've got the hang up button. Mode to switch between CDs, uh, mini disc originally and radio. So pretty familiar sort of audio head unit controls here. The other side of mine is blank, but on higher spec cars will include cruise control, automatic radar control, distance control, etc. As we go up and to the left of the steering column, we have the first of the stalks. Really nice little stubby stalks on this car. I'm enjoying using them. The inner barrel doesn't rotate, but has the logos for what happens when you push up, center, down, down, etc. So a push up is a quick miss. That will get us a quick wipe of the screen. Pull down, moves to intermittent, where the length of the gap between wipes is altered by this second barrel or thimble on the stalk. The 
Next, if we push down further, we go to low speed, and finally at the bottom, high speed. A pull towards you on this stalk gets you a screen wash and wipe, and a push away sets off the rear screen wash wipe. We pop over onto the right hand side, again the same chunky style of stalk, and that's our indicators, which is really interesting in that it's the correct side for the UK. Older British cars always had their indicator stalk on the right hand side because you're able to flick this while still operating the handbrake or the gear stick with the other hand. We've tended over the years to mix and match and have kind of aligned with mainland Europe with our stalks on the left. So this is one of, one of the things I keep getting wrong despite it being the correct side. And the end of this barrel allows you to go from lights off, lights on automatic, side lights as we would call them in the UK and dipped beam with main beam being achieved by a pull to flash or a push to lock on. Over on the right hand side of the dashboard you can see we've got another little set of controls and if you press this little instrument looking one followed by the up and the down on here it adjusts the brightness of your instrument display. If you're seeing some flickering on screen it also tells you this car is an early adopter of LED display lighting. This sets the brightness separately for when your headlights are on and when your headlights are off. So turn your headlights on and reset it and you get two different values for brightness. Most people would typically like a dimmer set of instruments when they're driving at night. Once you've set it, touching that a couple of times will alternate between the two different settings just in case you wanted to go for the daytime brightness at night. Trip and reset work the trip counter, which is in the bottom of the instruments. And if I press the trip button, you'll see the trip counter alternating between two different memories, A and B. And if I was to hold reset, then they would zero on whichever one I was on at the time. On this vehicle, it's worth mentioning air vents. So we've got this air vent on the right hand side of the driver's binnacle, which is quite evidently a face level vent, normal sort of arrangement. You can direct it and at the bottom, you have the option to close it off or open it up. That is complemented by outlets in the end of the dashboard, which blow onto the side windows. Another head level air vent, which aims at the driver. Higher up and much further away on the dashboard are two adjustable vents that blow air straight up across the windscreen to give you a face level vent. There are separate vents behind that to demiss the screen. And over on the left hand side of the dashboard we have what in my opinion is a beautiful piece of styling. Three air vents integrated into this sort of straked effect I guess you'd call it, enabling the passenger to direct air wherever they like. The instruments themselves are very clear and if I just start the engine up for a second. On the right hand side we have the engine temperature followed by the tachometer or rev counter. Uh, the red line is at 6600. In the bottom of that display is the gear we are currently in. So as we move the gear selector, it changes into the various positions. And if I use the Tiptronic system, I can select the individual gears. There are various warning lights, which I'm not gonna to demonstrate today, uh, available in the middle. 
And the little car logo on my vehicle being a lower spec basically indicates open apertures. So all the doors and tailgate. If you have the four wheel drive version, which is quite common, then that will also show you four wheel drive, two wheel drive and locked center diff. Left hand side is our speedo. And of note here is this is in kilometers per hour. And it is a legal requirement in the UK that speedos can read in miles per hour. So there's two ways in which these are corrected. One is replace the instrument backplate or modify the instrument backplate to display the appropriate miles per hour markings. Or like in my car, we have a head up display, which is a GPS based system, which monitors miles per hour speed and projects it onto the windscreen. Whilst we're up here on top of the dashboard, we'll just make reference to the parking sensor display. And that is capable of displaying which area you're getting too close to around your vehicle using those little displays, as well as the chime sound. And the button that I press in is the one on the side of the steering column marked corner sensor. And by hitting that, I can enable or disable the sounds so that it doesn't get really annoying if you're sitting with the engine running and you're close to something. Let's back off a little and take in the beautiful dashboard and we have this monitor sticking out from the side of the dash. It's hinged, it can go parallel to the dash, it can angle round towards the driver to give this sort of wrap round effects, minimize um, reflections in the wrong circumstances, etc., And that has multiple uses. Some of them are no longer possible because they only operate in Japan, but features such as when I put the car in reverse, it switches to our reversing camera are still there. And by playing around with the controls down here, we can run through functions like the Japanese sat-nav system, which obviously is not much use to us in the UK. It's DVD based and you can't get a UK disc for it. The settings on the vehicle, um, adjustments, when you hit the accept button, it goes into the menus for them. The FM radio, which in the UK, you'll only realistically be able to get Radio 2, just because there's a narrower bandwidth for Japanese radios look for. Um, and the information area, which is useful, has got fuel, um, tires, how long they've been on, how long since you last rotated them. It's more of a memory jogger than anything, just clocks up miles and time, and a service record so you can leave um, I last serviced the oil on this date or at these miles and it will do little reminders for you. The fuel is still quite usable despite being in Japanese. Um, even if you can't read kanji, then nine kilometers per liter is the average at the moment where I've been getting. Here is a little bar chart display, does the instantaneous fuel consumption and this is my range in kilometers. This button here, you can move to and hit OK, and that will zero the average. And this button at the bottom will allow us to go to a bar chart that shows you the last X number of trips. How many is it? One, two, three, four, eight trips. And how much fuel consumption was on those trips. So you can see just a little under 10 kilometers per liter has been what I've been getting over the last few days. And I've been doing relatively local short trips. I get that to 
10 or a little bit more on my longer trips. This is representative of having fun about six. So the various functions that that's useful for, <clears throat> and it can display DVDs if you've got the right uh, kit and region, etc. Take a small break from the buttons because plenty more of them to, to do and just look more generally at the interior. And the first thing to declare is my car has a non-standard fascia panel here, accommodating a two din or double din head unit, a rubbish one, I have to say, and that needs sorting out. But that means it can get UK radio stations, sat nav, etc., etc. Uh, I also use it to connect with my phone via Bluetooth for music and for calls. And that still links up with the controls on the steering wheel. We go down this stack. A really nice pop-out shelf with two cup holders. Uh, a space that's overly convenient to prop up a mobile phone, I've got to say. But it is an ashtray. Uh, slide that away and below that you've got a really nice storage cupboard which I'm keeping all my wires and chargers and rags and bits and pieces at the moment quite messy. Over on my left hand side there's this rather nice little compartment which I've been storing sweets in <laughs> uh, on the side of the passenger seat and there's this feature which is a cable to plug in a Nokia phone. I don't have a Nokia phone, so I shan't be using that, but cool nonetheless. And obviously if you had a Nokia phone, you could drop it in there. Okay, back up on the center console, we obviously have the gear selector, pretty conventional, pull down for reverse, neutral and drive, slide across to the left and then you have a tap forward tap backwards tiptronic as it's called on this car selector that just allows you to manually select the gears above the gear stick on my car again it's a low spec so we only have two buttons there are often four one is power and that holds gears longer and gives you a more sporty drive and snow allows the clutches in the gearbox to slip more and therefore get away easier in slippery conditions. <clears throat> Other buttons you may have here are two-wheel drive, uh, automatic selection of the gearbox, so it'll detect slippage and engage four-wheel drive, and lock to lock four-wheel drive in. Let's blast across this row of switches here, which are labelled in the Japanese language, so a little hard to decipher. It's basically get used to them. The top left is not useful anyway in that that brings up a guide to the vehicle. And it's a Japanese person speaking, so not much use unless you're Japanese anyway. Next to it is the number two and some more kanji, and this enables the rear TV set. which descends from the ceiling just between the driver and passenger. And that's able to mirror everything that you get up on that monitor there, including your DVDs. So I can put a DVD in my system down here and play it there and there. This button is quite obviously television, but because the car is analog and in the UK we have digital transmissions, that's not going to be any use to you. The button to the left of that one is image quality and that changes the resolution of the screen in the back to match the media that you're displaying on it. This button, if your vehicle is equipped with it and it would be as after 2007 vehicle, this button would turn on the bird's eye view camera, which is stitching together multiple camera images from around the car. This button is information, and when we press that, 
it brings up that menu which I showed you previously and this little joystick in the middle is able to toggle between the various areas and you can go and explore those by going in and pressing them here we have the time here we have a stopwatch here we have a compass and you can press the button and bring up a, a compass or a stopwatch DVD playing is pretty self-explanatory so if you've got a DVD in the slot that would be on the dashboard in a standard unit or one connected to a unit in the back then this would cause that to play and unlike UK cars it can play in the front so that is not disabled on my car even though it's a bad idea this button is menu and again takes you back to this screen I treat it as the back button. This button is one of my favourites because side blind brings up that view of the front wheel of the car with a little marker and the front edge of that marker indicates the front of the vehicle, how far it is, so you can kind of judge when you come up to curbs when you're level with the curb. This one is the wide area view um, button, but if your car like mine isn't fitted with that extra camera, then that won't do anything. And this button is for detail. Well, that's what it means, but I've been unable to work out a good use for it. Next level down, a little bit more familiar. So we have two temperature controls, one for either side of the car. And as soon as we start to use these, turn them, you'll see up on the dashboard, we get the display of temperature. And at the moment, they're both moving synchronously, or synchronously, I don't know, uh, in a synchronized manner. There's a button that says dual. If you press it, then that gives you separate control of either side of the car. Pressing the button in the middle will allow you to select where you want the heat to go. This button is demist and it puts all of the settings on the best settings to demist the car. This is free flow of air versus recirculate. And this is auto which allows the vehicle to do what it wants with the fan and the position of the air in order to, to achieve the temperatures that you've decided on. This button allows you to control the rear heating, which is separate to the front heating. So by pressing this, it brings up the temperature outside and the blank box tells you the rear heaters aren't on. This one is plainly heater controls, as in fan speed up and down. And it's nice to get back to something really conventional, hazard warning lights. But if we look up, we see we have an overhead display and we have visors. So we drop our visor, we have an illuminated mirror and we have a hammock for our mobile phone, which is really rather nice. Up here, we currently have a clock display. This will always revert back to Japanese time because it's connected to the atomic clock. So too clever for its own good. There'll be a lot of controls here on higher spec vehicles. On mine, we have the individual dome lights and a button which allows the lights to come on and off with the doors or not. Here we have a button that also says light but that one operates the very large rear dome light which is dimmable if you're in the rear. Then we have curtains in three positions around the vehicle and it's not that unusual to have curtains in a vehicle. 
but to have ones that operate this fast and nicely, I think is. And each curtain is controllable from there or in the rear. Just up there above the mirror, I have a microphone to enable hands-free calls. And as we glide out to the left along the nice bit of wood trim, I'm not gonna call it wood, we have a nice glove box, quite large. It also contains the DVD navigation system and yet another storage cubby. We look down in front of the passenger seat and I'll be able to show you one of the drawers below the seats. And then the seats themselves include armrests, which adjust by a magic system. So you pick them up, drop them down, and they stop where you put them, pick them up again, move them down, and they'll go to the bottom. So you can put them wherever you want and they will stay there. And I think that's probably quite enough for now because there's so many features and quirks in these vehicles that uh, we could go on forever. So in a future video, I'll give you a tour inside the back of the car and show you all the weird and wonderful stuff that's in there. As well as taking you for a drive to show you just how lively she is. I say, I don't really know how to categorize it. It's, I, I don't think it's very generous to call it a minibus, even though that's probably what we should be calling it. It's too much fun and it's too lively to be calling a minibus. It's too luxurious to be calling a minibus. It's just really, really interesting. Quirky vehicle, almost carving out its own niche. There's only really the Alphard that are in the same sort of category. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again real soon on To The Garage. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.